Good afternoon. I'm Steve Levine with the uh, New America Foundation. Um, we're, we're in the midst of the most turbulent age in energy since Rockefeller. The, the n number of countries involved, the volumes of energy in involved are, are unprecedented. Um, the, the impact, the potential impact on countries, on geopolitics, on geo geoeconomics has never been greater. But the epicenter of this whole boom that we're talking about is the United States. And the, and the center of it is, is a drilling method called fracking. So this is the subject of Russell Gold's book, new, new book called The Boom. So we're lucky to have Russell here with us. And uh, we're going to start with Russell making a few remarks. And then I'm going to engage him in a bit of conversation. And then, and then we'll open, up, open it up to questions. We should have plenty of time for a very nice conversation. We've got a full hour. So without further ado. Well, just picking up on what you said last week, I was in California at a conference where there are a number of CEOs there from major utilities, um, a coal company, solar company, and every and, and Stat Oil CEO was there. So across the energy spectrum, and they all, to a person, agreed we are at the beginning of a very profound energy transition. Um, we don't exactly know where it ends up, um, and. I think it could end up in any number of different directions, but, but there are some major changes undergoing right now. And I just wanted to, to start to kick off by, by talking about something that, as I reported this, I found very interesting. Um, and that was sort of this contrast between the, the European and the American approach to, to oil and gas exploration, um, or, or just industrial policy in general. Uh, typically, the Europeans um, have a what, what they more of a precautionary approach. They want to prove something is safe. They want to have a safety case developed before they go ahead um, and let a new technology drilling. The United States takes the opposite approach. We drill first and ask questions later. Um, and I uh, wanted to read a quote from Rex Tillerson in my book, uh, the CEO, chairman and CEO of ExxonMobil, because I thought it sort of summed up. Um, it says the United States doesn't subscribe to this approach. Exxon's Rex Tillerson for one approves, quote, if you want to live by the precautionary principle, then you crawl up in a ball and live in a cave, he said. So that's sort of, but, you know, it's easy to sort of chuckle at that and, um, and, and to sort of agree with the European approach, but this full throttle, let's just try things, let's use, you know, acid and, and, and explosives and nuclear bombs to see if we can get more oil and gas out of these rocks and then high pressure water, which ultimately did the trick, um, you know, was very risky, uh, but it totally changed the, the, the energy uh, landscape in, in the United States. Um, we had been producing less and less, we were going to become larger and larger importers, and then that completely turned around in 2007, 2008. We were running out of natural gas, we now have more natural gas than we know what to do with. Um, and, and that is slowly going to be uh, exported um, to other parts of the world. And so it, just thinking about this and, and the lessons from this energy boom, um, I, I find myself thinking a lot about the precautionary principle because we did go forward, drill first and ask questions later. And in some ways that worked out great. We had major technological changes, lots of energy. Uh, but we're, on, we're in an inflection point right now where um, if we want to keep doing this, if communities will you know, if, uh, to prevent communities from basically rising up and, and saying no more, um, you know, th there maybe needs to be more of a European approach to say, okay, what more can be done to make this safer, to protect communities, um, and to make this a less obtrusive um, process. So just some general thoughts to start very off. Very, very good. When, when we hear about shale, when we read about, about it, it's usually one of two things. It's from a policy standpoint, right. what, what should we do, what, what shouldn't we do, or it's, um, it's from one spectrum or the other politically. This is a necessary um, uh, factor in, in, the, in the resurgence of the United States, mm -hmm. American manufacturing renaissance, or the other side, a, uh, a, a r real environmental pushback. But I want to start, start from a, a very, very, very basics. What is shale? Um, so shale is a very dense rock 
it is what's known as source rock. It is where the oil and gas uh, was created. Um, it's a sedimentary rock which was created by uh, microorganisms, little zooplankton and, 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 and other um, tiny organisms which settled there and died and then ultimately were, was converted by heat and pressure over millennia um, into fossil fuels. So this is where oil and gas begins. And, and it's this incredibly dense rock. And over time, little bits of it, uh, the oil and gas, escape and travel up and often will keep traveling up, sometimes to the surface, sometimes they'll hit um, an impermeable barrier and pool there. And that's the great oil and gas reservoirs that, uh, of yore that, that people go, you know, try to find. Well, we've hunted most of those. We've found most of those. We've depleted most of those. So now we're going to trickier and trickier, deeper and deeper. So now uh, the industry has, be, has figured out now how to target the shale rock itself, this incredibly dense rock. That's, uh, that's the beginning of it all. Right. So you, th this book, beautifully written, by the way, it's, um, uh, and, 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 and much of it is a, a story, not, not policy driven at all. Um, and I wonder if you, if, if you could, one, one of the parts that I liked was where you went around the world and described mm -hmm. the shales. Right. Um, could you do that? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, let's start here in the United States, which is where shale exploration begins. Um, the United States gets, was very lucky in this sense that as the continent developed, you had the Appalachian mountain chain on the east, towards the east, you had the Rockies on the west, and this great inland sea that basically covered everything in between, from Pennsylvania straight through to where Denver is. Uh, my, my home in Texas was, uh, is under, would have been underwater. And in that great sea, that's where it was just a perfect environment to create shales, because you had all sorts of um, organisms living off the sun, and then they died, went to the bottom. And, and you just had these enormous contiguous shale resources, which we now call the Marcellus and the Barnett and the Fayetteville, and et cetera, et cetera, the Eagleford. Um, but elsewhere, the, the inland seas didn't exist quite as much. And so you find shales around the world. The, the North Sea boom of the 1970s, well, there's the uh, Kimmeridgean shale underneath there. And, and uh, the, great Saudi Arabian oil, the great Saudi Arabian oil fields come from shales um, as well. Um, and, and everywhere you go around the world, the Siberian oil fields, the Bosanov shale, uh, there are shales. And they're all slightly different. Um, some are waxier. Some um, were generated more by woody, like dead trees, dead plants. Those tend to be a little harder, uh, waxier to, 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 to extract the oil and gas from. Um, and it's, it's sort of, it's interesting because if you, if you think about the one shale in the United States, which has eluded the industry. They've drilled into it, but they can't quite figure out the special sauce to make it work. Um, it's the Monterey Shale in California, which happens to be outside of that inland sea. It was developed in a different way. And, and I think that's why internationally you're seeing s some re one of the reasons you're seeing more trouble developing these shale assets, because the shales are just, just they're not quite as good and contiguous and just nice, big and thick, which is what the oil and gas drillers love. Right. So, so is it, is it, it r really is that the, the drillers, uh, because w we read about China has the largest yes. shale potentially mm -hmm. in the world, the Bajanov in Russia, Poland would love to have, Ukraine is having, it would love to get off of mm -hmm. Russian gas, but you know, dr drillers have gone in there. Are they just spoiled? They just, do they want it just one <laughs> block and we drill in it and they don't want anything else? Well, there are a couple reasons why International oil and gas, uh, international shale development hasn't taken off. Um, first of all, we have drilled 100 times more wells in the United States than any other part of the world. We have just drilled enormous number of wells. We understand the geology. We understand the rocks better. So even though we know there's shale in Poland, we don't know it as intimately. Uh, is it the right kind of shale? Is it brittle? How thick is it? How deep is it? What's the extent? So some of the, the drilling that's gone on internationally has been a little more hit and miss than what we found in the United States. But the bigger difference is, um, uh, has to do with mineral rights. In the United States, mineral rights are owned privately. And typically, not always, but typically the surface owner owns the mineral rights as well. And so that means if I come to you, you own th the land and the mineral rights, I'm, if I'm a landman, I'm going to cut you a check and say, you might not want a drilling rig, on the edge of your property, but here's $10,000 an acre plus, you know, an eighth royalty to make it worth your while. That doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. The incentives are very different. There's not that profit incentive. So you go to a place like Poland, you go to 
um, uh, Argentina, Russia, etc. And the local communities have been very upset because they're sort of saying, well, what's in it for us? We understand, you know, we're concerned about the environmental impacts. We don't want the trucks. We're concerned about the earthquakes. Um, all these very legitimate uh, issues, and we're not getting anything from it. Right. And, yeah. and, and then just to real round it off, you've got water issues in China, um, and you've got population density issues in China. I mean, that's, that's like New Jersey, basically. Yeah. So, so you would contend... Well, population density-wise. <laughs> right. So you, you would contend that if, if the French, for yes. example, had, had, uh, were individually able to profit, then you might have shale in the Paris Basin. Uh, I think you would have a lot better chance of it, absolutely. Okay. Your family did this. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, uh, you describe um, the far, the family farm. Yes. Uh, Which I should say, you know, it's not where I was, you know, we're an urban family raised in Philadelphia. We just called it the farm. And this was sort of 100 acres that we bought on the cheap because the local farmers, it was too hilly and rocky. Local farmers didn't even want it. So it was something that was picked up for cheap vacations. So don't, I, I don't want to give the sense that, that we were out there, you know, tilling the land or anything. That's not what this was. But it was, it was land that we felt a connection to. And I've been going there since I was a kid. So, you know, it's just, we have a deep connection. It's a place we went to get away from Philadelphia. And, and your, your father signed a, a deal. Yep. They said, when they called me and they said, what should we do? Um, and it was, it was sort of a, you know, I've been at that point for 20 years a reporter, 10 years reporting on, on oil and gas. And, you know, I, I sort of knew all the details, but they were suddenly asking me a, a much tougher question, much tougher assignment, which was, well, should we do this? And how can we do this? Should we embrace drilling or keep it at arm's length? And it really got me thinking about some of the bigger questions that we, we all face, and, and as the United States is facing right now also. Okay. So you, you, um, you went out, you've gone out and watched fracking. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> what does that look like, and who, who are these guys doing it? Well, so I, in the book I describe um, a 24-hour period where I went out into the Bakken with Marathon Oil uh, and to the drilling of uh, the Irene Kovalov 1118H. Uh, one particular well, nothing special about this well. It was one of 10 being drilled at the time in North Dakota. Uh, this, was, this was just where they would have me. And um, it, it, was, it was sort of an amazing experience because here is this technology that is changing the country, uh, changing our, our, our economics and our politics, uh, and yet the number of firsthand accounts of what it's like to be there and what actually happens um, are, are minuscule, are tiny. You, you really have to go looking for them. Uh, there are a couple of good blogs actually right now that, that are worth reading uh, mm. on that if you're, if you're really interested. So I'm out there. It, it's almost everyone I talk to had the same story. And it all sort of begins with, well, I was a landscaper or I was doing housing construction until 2008 and then whoosh. So this was a lot of, these were people who are used to working outside, used to working hard and had been involved in the real estate boom, had been employed by the real estate boom. And then when that went away, they started looking around, and this is what they found. Um, and in fact, that's one reason this has been so beneficial to the economy, is that it's been able to um, sort of sponge up a lot of that excess labor. Um, and so I'm out there, and it's just it's sort of this fascinating, you have to sort of imagine that they're building a small factory on a two-acre pad. And it's, they have it down to a science, you, you can't imagine two, three hundred different pieces of equipment all arranged onto this pad. You can barely walk anywhere, it's so tight. They have the water trucks, which are the back end of, of trucks, you know, the, the trailers of trucks, so close to each other you can barely even put your hand in between, you can't even do that. Um, they warn you, constantly look where you're walking, look down because there's so many pipes on the ground that you could hurt and fall and hurt yourself. Uh, and then you get into the data van, which is really where all this happens, where all the information comes, comes in and where they send out everything. And, you know, it sort of reminded me, first of all, um, you know, kind of reminded me a little bit of, uh, uh, well, the data van, uh, that's a, there, there are two vans there. I'm sorry, I got a little mixed up. Two vans. One where they test the frac fluid. This really, everyone's con controversial frac fluid. What's in it? And that reminded me very much of the Breaking Bad RV, right? If Jesse was running it, but not Walter White because um, it was like a 20-year-old kid there working there. But then you get into the data, data van, and, and that's where everything is run out of, computers everywhere, and it sort of reminded me a little bit of, the, of like a NASA um, uh, moon launch or satellite launch, except instead of everyone having being clean cut, 
Um, they're, it's very hard to find a, a hair cutting place there. It's booming too much. And so they, they all had big long hair and facial and mustaches. So sort of NASA meets NASCAR is what it felt like to me. And, and, and what do they actually do? Follow directions sent from Houston. Um, you know, they had this 40 page, what they call the PROG, a program, and it told them exactly what to do. Turn on this amount of water, fire up this, release this ball, because they have, they have the well already drilled, goes down about two miles, and then the lateral, the, the, the horizontal leg of it run, ran about another two miles. And their job was to release these balls down into the well. The balls would open up a particular section. So they start on the far end, maybe 200, 300 feet. And then you send in extraordinarily high pressure frac fluid, mostly water with chemicals, biocides, friction reducers, and a lot of sand. Frack that one particular segment and then keep doing it. 30 different frack stages for this particular well. And it would take them about, I think it took them 29 hours to do the entire fracking. Just one after the other. And it was just, it was, it was a routine. You know, they had it down to routine. They had the coffee going, they had music going, you know, they, it was just, uh, now life inside the data van's nice. Life outside the data van is a little tougher. I mean, it was uh, 40 degrees. The wind was blowing overnight. It got down into the 20s, and you had people working there. Um, you had sand, silica blowing because you know you're, you're putting the sand into the hopper to mix it up, and you've got fine dust everywhere. Uh, the date, you know, the chemicals they have this sort of sweet, kind of saccharine sweet smell, um, and uh, not not. I would not particularly want to work outside. It is it is a tough job, and a lot of people show up there and last two weeks. They didn't realize how physically demanding it is. And uh, fracking, the, uh, the actual action of fracking yeah. means you sent those, send those balls, and there are small explosions, right? No, it's not even explosion, it's water. Um, you know, the, there, there may be a small perf, uh, little, with a perf gun to, to break through the well, but essentially water doesn't compress. So if you pump water in hard enough, eventually you'll overcome and cause a crack in the rock, and the water will, will flood into these new cracks uh, bringing the sand with it, and it will leave the sand behind to prop it open. And that sort of creates the, the cracks, and you bring the water out, and you have all these little fine cracks where the oil and gas could flow out of. Um, and basically, you know, the cracks have much lower pressure than what's in the rock, so, so um, nature likes to balance things out. So, so the oil and gas will try to move from inside the high pressure to the low pressure and flow into the well. So it's, it's water. And at one point I, I, I point out that this is 200 times the the pressure which the water is being pressed against the rock, 200 times uh, your car tire pressure. And if you were to sit you know, in a meditative pose on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, down 12,000 feet, I believe is the deepest part of the Gulf of Mexico, the pressure of the water above you, you know, would not be equal to the pressure that they're putting onto the Bakken to crack it. And for anyone like me who's ever dove down six or seven feet and your ears start to hurt with the pressure, imagine going down 12,000 feet. So it's uh, muscular. Yeah, yeah. So you know, seven years, six, seven years ago, mm -hmm. the, pl the, the plans were from Qatar uh, to ship Bring it LNG in. to the United States. Right. Gazprom established an office in Houston, mm -hmm. and uh, it was developing the Stockman natural gas field. Right. They bought or, or le leased a pipeline from Mexico up in to California to, uh, to ship that, s that stuff. The United States was spending uh, uh, $365 billion a year, the uh, uh, balance of payments mm -hmm. on its oil. Now, the U.S. is on the verge of exporting the gas, right. the, that balance of payment quickly being reversed. This fracking was invented five years ago, right? A little more than five years ago. Um, I mean, we saw the first. I, I meant that as a joke. You, okay. you, you, you actually go back to the 19th century, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, yes, it, there's sort of three stages of fracking. It's actually very divisive, right? Because, you know, the, the, the anti-fracking people, the fractivists, will say, well, this technology was created just a few years ago. And um, this is why I don't have a sense of humor about it, because I get caught in this all the time. It was only a few years ago, and so it's a new, untested technology, and they're partially right. And then the industry will say, no, we've been doing this for 60 years. In fact, you probably got this, too. I just got a happy 65th birthday card from some organization here in Washington celebrating fracking. Um, and they're partially right too. I and mean, we have been doing a form of sort of low pressure fracking. But I trace it all the way back to uh, the 1860s when uh, you had just the beginning of the oil age. You had Colonel Drake running around western Pennsylvania drilling wells. 
Um, and as it turned out, when you drilled wells back then, you often came up dry because we had no, uh, no way to know where the water was. And you could come, you know, or excuse me, where the oil was. You come this far from hitting an oil seam. And that would be the difference between a good well and a bad well, between being wildly rich and, and being destitute. And so into all this, a, a, a colonel from the Union Army who had um, been in the Battle of Fredericksburg watched shells raining down on his troops, noticed that shells that fell into ditches covered with water exploded a different way. He said, well, why don't we put a bomb down to the bottom of these newfangled wells, cover with water, and detonate the bomb, see if we can create new cracks to hit those oil seams. Uh, and so, you know, I went back and I thought to myself as I was re researching this, well, there's no way that's really fracking. I mean, that's, that's blowing stuff up. That's a different, uh, but the original patent, if you read it, says that the purpose, the art of, of, you know, as they call it, was to create fractures in the rock. So this whole idea that we can drill a well, but then after that we're going to go in and we're going to create fractures to create a big drainage area is really as old as the, as the oil age at this point. And could, could you take that forward a little bit? How did, how did we get where we are? So fracking was very successful back in the 1860s and 70s. In fact, Colonel Drake, the, the Drake's well, the founder, um, he ends up penniless because he can't, you know, he, living on the streets of New York. Um, but Colonel Roberts, who invents this torpedo, this, 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 fracking, this early fracking device, ends up one of the richest people in the United States. Everyone wants this torpedo. Everyone wants to use it. He has it patented. He charges a lot of money for it. Um, anyone who wants to... Uh, so there's this big trade, actually, in people uh, sort of doing um, knockoff torpedoes. And they've got to do it at night because if they get caught, they'll be thrown in jail. And so that's uh, where the word moonlighting actually comes from because they would do it under the moon. They would light their charges. And so that's all that's going fine for, for 10, 20 years. And then we find Spindletop in Texas. And there are such big oil fields that the oil just comes gushing up on its own. You don't need to blow anything up. Um, just giant oil fields. And for 20, 30 years, it was sort of the era of the gushers. And then those start to go away, at least here in the United States. And we have to get back to this, what can we do? This sort of this petroleum engineer's quest to do whatever they can to the rock, to, to, to bend it to their will. And so that's when you have fracking come back. And there's this early, this early what they call the hydrofrac treatment, where they're using much smaller amounts of water. And it's very successful. You go back and you read like the petroleum magazines of the 1950s, and everyone's using this new hydrofrac treatment. It's really popular. They license it to Halliburton, which was around back then. And that sort of continues until, but the big difference is they're not fracking shales. They're fracking much sandstones, limestones. It's much easier to work with rock, much more porous rock. Um, and it, then in the late 1990s, Mitchell Energy, George Mitchell, um, north of Fort Worth, he just has this hankering. He's, he's, he's a stubborn guy, and he knows that if you just work on it long enough, they can figure out a way to crack open the shale. And finally, one day, one of his engineers figures, figures it out. And the secret is lots of water and lots of pressure. It's almost too simple for anyone to have realized. And that's what begins this, five years ago, as you say, uh, this revolution we're, underneath, we're, we're undergoing. All right. All right. So, so, um, so you've got this very, very powerful revolution, mm -hmm. which, you, uh, which you also use that phrase in, in the book, mm -hmm. um, underway in the United States, um, that has caused some consternation. Um, uh, what do you, you know, uh, where do you com uh, come down on that? Uh, uh, before I get to that, I wanted to ask about the, about the, um, uh, just, yeah, uh, is it wonder, safe? Is it, yeah. Right. This is an industrial process. Uh, there's no question about that. Industry, there are issues with industry. Anywhere you go, um, does it cause earthquakes? Injection wells do cause earthquakes. Not The fracking itself doesn't, but once you have all this extra waste water, they're putting it down, um, you're going to cause earthquakes. Um, I mean, we have now large numbers of small earthquakes in Oklahoma and, and Texas, and it's been proven, scientifically proven. Um, is it contaminating the water? That's, yes, there are some instances of that, bad wells. Uh, once again, it's not fracking itself, it's the wells. And I don't mean this as an excuse, because if you're going to frack a well, there's a whole series of industrial activities that have to go along with it. Drilling the well, fracking the well, uh, disposing of the waste. I mean, it's all sort of part of this kind of the big fracking package. So where I come down on this is that we're doing it. We're getting a lot of benefits from it. 
And there are ways to do it right. There are ways to do it which minimize these risks and minimize uh, the, the, the negatives involved. You know, I bring up uh, earthquakes. Well, the state of Texas finally got around to hiring a seismologist. And it's been only 100 years that we've been drilling for oil and gas, but we now have a seismologist who works for the oil and gas uh, regulator. Actually, I don't think we actually have one yet, but we put out for, you know, we, we, we post it on Craigslist or wherever we post it. Um, so so there, this is a, a kind of a common sense solution to this, right? If you don't want to lubricate existing earthquake faults, maybe you shouldn't license and permit an injection well where there are faults. So you have a seismologist to tell you there are faults right here, but not right here. Ah, so we can do injection here, but not right there. Uh, with the water, if you build wells correctly and you cement them correctly and you test to make sure the cement is good, you're not going to have methane leakage. You're not going to have the methane going up into the aquifers so that when people turn on their water, all of a sudden their water's bad. Um, you know, once again, th these are not these are not hugely technical fixes. I mean, what, the, the other issue is methane leakage. You know, if methane leaks out into the air, it's a very potent greenhouse gas, contributes to, to, to global warming, uh, to climate change. So how do you make sure that we're not leaking methane? Well, as it turns out, you can hire somebody to walk around with an infrared camera and detect it. It's not really that difficult. And you can eliminate, I don't know the numbers, but the great majority of the leakage, not 100%, but a, the majority with some very simple fixes. It's plumbing. So we can do a much better job with this. And, and I think it makes a lot of sense to continue fracking. Because if we're not doing it here, if we're not doing the oil and gas development here, we'll just go back to being an importer. And the same environmental problems, the same social problems, we'll just export those. And I have a lot of confidence, um, hopefully it's not misplaced, that we can figure out ways to do it right in the United States. And then export not just the technology to do it, but the know-how to do it right. And then you get a lot less, in, the, in that scenario, you get a lot less pushback from, from some communities in, in Europe, Quebec, and so on. Yeah, if we can, <coughs> excuse me, I mean, if we can demonstrate that not just do we have the technology to extract the oil and gas, but we've developed a good suite of ways to do it so you're not emitting, um, you're not emitting methane and, and, and BTEX chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can prove that we're doing a good job building the wells and the cementing. Uh, I, I would think that there are a lot of communities that would like the economic benefit of it. So then you just have to figure out what to do with the trucks because that's the number one complaint. When I'm traveling, when I travel, and I've traveled through a lot of shale development places, you always hear the number one complaint are trucks. There's so many trucks on the road. There never used to be trucks here. I used to be able to drive to my, you know, my friend's house, and now I can't even take a right turn here. So I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but that, that's, we're still working on that. So, so you, you used that, that, that whole answer was the, the pronoun in the whole thing was we. we, uh, we yeah, as I though know, this I is a we. public, no, no, as though this is a, a public policy question when. What's the it's big a, we? It's, it's a commercial, it's, it's a commercial issue. W what is, uh, the co aren't the, the companies themselves push back on. When, when yeah. I say we, I'm talking about everyone. Yep. The industry, regulators, people, because they, they all are involved. Okay, so what's with the companies? I mean, th this is to their uh, benefit to, uh, to use the best practices so they can continue, correct? Yes, they, I, and, and that's a lesson which they're slowly, some are realizing, some aren't. So there's sort of two ways to look at that. First of all, in places where there's been a lot of political pushback, uh, Colorado is a perfect example. Four communities last November voted to vote for a moratorium or a ban on fracking. Uh, not surprising it happened in Boulder. Kind of surprising it could happen in, in places like Broomfield. So I mean, there's a lot of opposition there, and there's talk about a statewide uh, vote and moratorium. Um, Lo and behold, all of a sudden we have the three big operators in Colorado working with the governors coming up with a whole new suite of regulations, basically saying, we want to be regulated more, we want to prove to you we can do it right. I don't think that's a coincidence that those two are going on at the same time. But the other thing to remember is um, I was playing around with some data from Pennsylvania, number of wells drilled and, and operators, and I forget the exact number, I apologize, but it was something like 150 or 200 different companies in the last 12 months drilled wells in Pennsylvania. So. You have a group like the Center for Sustainable Shale Development, which is Chevron and Shell and EQT, some of the big companies. But what about the companies that are doing two wells a year? And what about the companies that are doing the smaller companies? So there are some, those are difficult questions to get at, you know? So let's say we can, the, the big companies, the Chevrons, the Shells, realize that it's in their best interest to do good practices, to spend the extra money. What about the smaller companies? It's, 
it's not clear to me how, how that's going to be resolved. Mm -hmm. But I'm watching. Yeah. That's yeah. the journalist in me now. Yeah. <laughs> so the, 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 um, the scenario as foreign players that have skin in the game, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia and Russia mm -hmm. primarily, the, the most to lose uh, by, by shale revolution spreading abroad, take, take solace in, in the, uh, the glass-half-full scenario, which is that mm -hmm. the decline rates are so steep the recovery of, of gas and oil from shale, 2%. You have a big, big piece of rock and then sweet spots. Right. Once you hit that sweet spot, then, then what? And, th and, that, and that scenario is, uh, just, uh, just for the benefit of, of the, uh, the audience, we peak at around 2020, 2022, and then mm -hmm. uh, levels and then starts right. going down. And I get emails you know, from Sa you know, Saudi friends who say, you know, this is flash in the pan, you know, enjoy it while you got it, and then, and then you know, we're going to make hay again. <laughs> um, but I always say Are they right? No, I, I don't think they're completely right. Um, I mean, there's sort of a couple things to think about here. In order to keep production growing, you need to drill a lot of wells, because you just put your wells, these are, these are overachievers, right? They'll, they'll peak, and then they'll, they'll drop off. So you need to drill the next one, the next one. So if there's anything in terms of opposition that gets in the way and slows that down, that will impact production. Uh, but on the other hand, for everyone who says, oh, well, 2022 will be gone, da, 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 I say, go to um, Kern County, California. You know, this is a 100-year-old, 100-plus-year-old oil field out there. And once you've drilled the wells, once the companies have put the pipelines in, they've sunk all this capital cost, it's in their interest to figure out ways to get a little bit more out. You know, they went in, they got maybe 10% of the oil and gas in place, just the easy stuff, and then they come in and they do what's called secondary oil recovery, tertiary oil recovery. They are very good at figuring out how to get more out. And right now with the shales, they're just getting a fraction of the oil and gas out. And they've drilled all these wells. So they will go back into those wells and figure out how to get another 2 and 3 and 4 percent out. Uh, so you know, tell your Saudi friends, the prices might go up a little, but I, I think this is a resource that's going to be around past 2022. So the, the, the history of oil is, is technology uh, giving new life and bring, bringing new mm -hmm. r revolutions, and, and you don't see that stopping. Uh, no, I, I, yeah. th I think there'll be incremental improvements in, in shale. I mean, uh, some of the existing oil fields will start off with 10% recovery, and 70 or 80 years later, they're up to 80% recovery, and they're just finding new technologies to get more and more out. Um, I don't see... I haven't heard anyone give me an explanation why that won't also be the case for shale. Now, uh, equally, one, one of the subtexts that, that one sees in, in, in the discourse on fracking is, it, it's this question, should we do fracking? And, and, and your tone, tone seems to be, what, what do you mean, sh should we be, we're doing it, we're going to be doing it, and, and incidentally, it's going to spread everywhere. Is this right? Is that? Yeah, well, I, we, we whether it spreads everywhere, I think that's still a little bit of an open question. But certainly in the United States, we, we're fracking 100 wells a day. You know, it, it's almost like um, if sometimes the facts get in the way of a good argument. You know, it's like the facts are we are fracking. I mean, right now there's this big discussion going on about should we be exporting natural gas. Well, we've already permitted enough facilities in the United States that once they're built, we will be the world's second largest natural gas exporter behind Qatar. So the question we really sh are asking is should we be number one or number two in the world, not should we be doing it. It's... I mean, the, 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 you know, the, the cart's out of the, you know, the, the horse's nose is in, the camel's nose is already in the tent. Right. Um, so it, it would be very difficult for me to see the political will to sort of roll this back and say, ah, oh, we're going to need moratoriums. It could happen. We could have different places. It certainly is, is a possibility in Colorado. I just haven't seen it yet. There's a lot of political momentum there. There's also a lot of political momentum in, in renewables right now. Um, there's a lot of, just like there's opposition to fracking, there's a lot of support for, for renewables. And that's where I think you might see a little bit more of that tension because um, politics and, and what people want are going to start really pushing and influencing these different energy resources. All right, okay, so let, uh, let's get into that a, bit, a little bit. The, there seems to be something when, uh, otherly Mm -hmm. about maybe it's the word fracking, <laughs> but, but it, 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 it's, it, it seems to, to trigger unusual... It ruffles the feathers. Yeah, it's the, 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 the apprehension, it's, it's, it seems to be Well, you know, the, you know where the word comes from, or, or at least what the, the association is, is that it comes from Battlestar Galactica. 
that's where it entered the popular lexicon, and it was used as a curse word there to, to avoid FCC censors. So by the time the industry starts talking about fracking, spelling it slightly differently, that had already kind of been out there. So yes, it, is, it definitely has that uh, profanity uh, touch to it. Right, so, uh, all right, so how, how did, just in the big picture yes. in which, um, you know, we're, uh, the, the narratives are energy transformation, uh, climate change, right. You know, getting off uh, fossil fuels, uh, moving toward uh, something. How does fracking fit into that big lo uh, long arc picture? Well, here's, here's my pitch. We're going through an energy transition. The last thing you want to do when you're going through an energy transition is, is being forced to do it because you're short of energy. Right? That's where it gets chaotic, it gets dangerous. Um, you know, you get geopolitical struggles over resources. We actually have an abundance of resources right now in the United States and more generally developing around the world. So this is a great time to pursue uh, an energy transition. And the other sort of good piece of news in that sense is that if you want to talk about renewables and bringing more renewables onto the grid, wind and solar, you, know, you need what are, what's called balancing. You need something available so that when the wind and the sun shut down, it's available. Now, there are different ways to do it, uh, but natural gas is a great fuel for turning on and turning off and help balancing the grid and keeping the grid robust. So there are ways you could certainly envision a world where you have significantly more re uh, renewables than we're using right now balanced by this lower carbon natural gas. Is that where we're heading? It's certainly a possibility, but uh, you know, we'll have to come back here in 10 years and find out. All right, just uh, one more and then, and, then, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Um, the other n narrative that's out there is U.S. energy independence and U.S. manufacturing revival. And the, the Renaissance. The, the, yeah, the Renaissance. And these, these are you know, the good news stories after these years uh, of reading, and we still read, American decline, mm -hmm. China rise, d the jobs question, economic uh, questions, and fracking. Right. Fracking comes in, and this is going to save us. How much of that, what piece of that is, that, is it all accurate? Hyperbole? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, look, there's no question that the United States is the envy of large parts of the world right now because of its inexpensive energy. Europe would love to have the inexpensive natural gas that we do. Um, natural gas in Asia it costs four times as much as, as in the United States. So there's certainly an attractiveness to build some manufacturing here. And there's a lot of talk about this manufacturing renaissance. Um, there are some petrochemical facilities that have started to be built. It's not a renaissance yet, uh, but it is slowly happening. On independence, we are never going to be independent of the rest of the world, nor should we be. There's, always, there, there's a lot of good reason to have trade of oil and, uh, moving, moving around the world. What we are heading towards as we reduce our imports is that we're no longer utterly dependent on one or two countries. When you need less, you can be uh, pickier about where you get it from. Or if in Libya, for instance, all of a sudden the spigots close because of um, you know, political instability, that doesn't send us in a, in a tizzy because there are other ways to make up that oil. So when you're no longer dependent on specific nations, does that mean you're independent? No, but you're, you're a lot lo farther along to it. And your, your foreign policy is a lot less driven by the need to keep those oil spigots on. Mm -hmm. And I, we're certainly heading in that direction right now. Yeah, and, uh, j just on the, uh, I just wanted to nail you down a bit because you, you added in a qualifier uh -oh. on the Renaissance. We're not in a Renaissance yet, meaning you think that that's not hype. Oh, no, no, no. Um, I think the jury's still out on that. Um, there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of interest, but one does not build a lot of new manufacturing just on energy prices. There are a lot of, you know, where are the markets, where is labor, you know, there are all sorts of different issues. Um, I have not yet seen the investment numbers to back up uh, the, the claim of a renaissance. And, th and that's something, frankly, it's only really been developing the last few months, where it suddenly realized that the renaissance is not moving quite as quickly as people thought. And I think that bears paying attention to. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's, uh, let's get some questions uh, from the audience. If you have a, a question, just ra uh, raise your hand, identify yourself, and wait for the mic. Uh, would anyone like to start? Hi. 
Uh, my name is Hugh McElrath. I'm a retired intelligence officer. Um, to what extent do you think the gas suppresses oil, uh, I mean, coal production globally, globally, mm -hmm. or does it just augment coal production and we end up actually burning all of the carbon anyway? Well, I know you emphasize globally, but let me start in the United States, because the, the lesson for the United States is very simple. More gas has been displacing coal. Uh, cheap gas displaces coal. As gas gets more expensive, it becomes a little more, uh, some coal comes back on. But there's been no question that gas has been displacing coal. And cities like New York are a lot more breathable now because of that. Um, New York's air is better than it's been in, in a couple decades because of that. However, so what happens? We have abundance of coal that we're not using, we begin exporting it. Um, the port of Baltimore, I think, has turned into a major coal exporting port. So, Clearly, if you look at places like China, and increasingly India as well, air pollution is becoming a bigger issue, and it's becoming a very political issue, and, and a potentially destabilizing issue. So therefore, those countries have a lot of interest in doing what's happening in the United States, replacing their coal production with gas production. Um, it, has the, it has a great potential to do just that, to displace, um, instead of just augment. Um, whether it ultimately ends up displacing versus augmenting depends a lot on energy efficiency. If there's a lot, if there's a push towards energy efficiency and making the kilowatts and the barrels go farther, then yes, I think potentially you could start seeing some coal that, that stays in the ground. Um, but that's, let me put it this way, at least we can have this conversation. A couple years ago we couldn't even have that conversation. So we've, we've made some progress in that we can have this conversation, but there still needs to be the gas supplies and there has to be more energy efficiency. Because otherwise you end up with the sort of the classic energy paradox, which is energy gets more plentiful, gets cheaper, we use more of it. Hello, my name is Roberta Stanley. <clears throat> I'm a former reporter too and a retired state of Michigan employee. We sit in a unique geographic area and of course a political one. This um, area endured an earthquake, and the allegation was that it, it stemmed from a fracking area out in middle Virginia. Could mm -hmm. you address that, please? Um, I have read a lot of the peer-reviewed literature on earthquakes in the Southwest and even in Ohio, and that's pretty clear that those are related. Um, the Virginia earthquake, I haven't seen anyone conclusively show that that was related. So I'm personally a little leery at this point that it was caused by it, uh, that particular earthquake. So. And just real quickly, just maybe to finish the thought. When we talk about fracking earthquakes, they are also, these are earthquakes that would happen over time. 10,000 years we'd have, you know, have an earthquake sometime. So, what fracking is doing is speeding up those earthquakes. So it's not causing any new earthquakes, it's just speeding up earthquakes and faults that, that are already having pressure on them. So uh, my sense is the Virginia one probably wasn't related. Where you sit. What was I, that? I was luckily in my car. I thought I had a flat tire, but people in the building where I worked said it was absolutely frightening. And, you know, <clears throat> we're still repairing them. But my the Washington Monument. I just, given the, the level of activity where that was, it just, I haven't seen anything. I mean, you really need to be scientific about this, and I have not seen anything that would indicate that it was. It, it was a location removed from the city, and you know the economics of it. It would be curious to have a full fledged investigation. Well, uh, you know, I, I disagree with you on that. There's a lot of seismo seismological work in the universities going on to look at that very issue, these oh, very, very issues. Good. So. I hear that. Thank you. Hey, <coughs> my name is Bryce Jordan. I'm a graduate student at Georgetown. And uh, I was just, you know, as you, as you said, there's been kind of a, a lack of oversight and regulation. And uh, on the state level, um, pushback has caused at least regulation to be part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could speak, uh, this is probably a little naive, but I'm wondering if you could speak a little about um, how regulation of fracking, where that conversation is in Congress and uh, in the Obama administration. Um. I 
don't really see much of it in Congress. Um, the Obama administration, to me at least, and, and this is from a, an observer, um, and I don't report on the politics of it as, as closely as I do other things, they've seemed to have staked out a very pro-fracking position. Um, Secretary Moniz has been, even before he was Secretary, was, was sort of pro-fracking. Uh, that's been the push. They seem to reserve their political fights and, and some of their regulatory muscle for, for um, changing the rules and regulations on emissions for power plants. So I don't see this really as more of a state issue at this point. Hi, my name is Ben Nussdorf. I'm a senior policy analyst with the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, regarding what you t spoke about and seismologists in Texas, isn't uh, isn't the underground injection control program something which is under the auspices of the EPA? Uh, so what, shouldn't the EPA be assuming responsibility for that as opposed to the state of Texas? Or is there a gap somewhere that I'm missing? That's an excellent question. I, need to, I don't want to answer that. and um, I don't want to give you a very specific answer because you raise a really good point there. Um, and I'm not sure the extent to which this is a program where the states can um, assume responsibility for it or the EPA when the states don't want to. I suspect that that's what it is. Um, but yes, you're, you're right that this is, there is a federal role for the EPA. And it is my understanding that there are no injection wells, that n no permits anywhere right now for injection wells require a seismological assessment. So whether that's state or, or federal. Um, but I would suspect that that's coming. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jill Shankleman. Uh, I work on social impacts of uh, oil and gas, mostly in developing countries. Uh, I agree very much with what you were saying about, about Europe. I think in the end, in my country, the UK, if we go ahead, it'll be under very tight regulation. But the real issue is going to be the actual footprint print on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a small, crowded country, and some of the first places are a very, very densely populated upscale areas. So do you see any trends in the sector uh, about being able to really reduce that physical above ground footprint? You know, there were there are certainly some trends in the past where there, the, the pad, um, the footprint has gotten smaller. but. Realistically, you're still talking one to two acres for an eight-well pad. I haven't seen it get much smaller than that. I don't think you can, really. Um, so, well, right, that's for, eight, that's for eight wells going off in all directions, and then you need another pad, you know, a quarter mile down the road. Because, you know, as you probably know, when you frack, even if you're doing a great job of fracking, you're, the frack wings are only covering maybe 400 feet in either direction. So if you want to get all the oil and gas out, then you need to go to the next place and, and try to connect them. So um, yes, there is, there is an above ground footprint. Um, you know, that said, the industry has managed to do it in a place like Fort Worth, you know, which is completely a very large city. And it's amazing when you drive around Fort Worth, they, they're very creative. You know, there will be uh, interstate exit ramps, uh, you know, those little grass medians, and boom, there, there's, a, there's a well there. I mean, they, they find very creative places to sort of to stick them in, even in the middle of a city. So it, it can be done. Uh, Eric, Eric Pages with Onshoreworks. I'm currently heading up a research project looking at um, uh, the local economic impacts of Marcella Shale in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, really what, what we're finding to a large extent is that you know, most of the communities there are a little disappointed in terms of the local job generation that has mm -hmm. occurred. Many of the workers are coming from Texas and other places that are more, uh, you have longer experience working in uh, drilling and things like that. Uh, what's your take on the regional implications of, of, of the shale plays? Um, is it going to benefit the local communities? Um, you know, certainly I understand the big picture, cheaper energy is, right. could have an impact on manufacturing, but being uh, nearby or proximate to the shale resources, is that going to be a benefit to these communities? You know, I think there's, there, what I've read indicates that there is an economic benefit. Um, a lot of those jobs that are created are truck driving. You know, that you're, you're absolutely right. The more technically skilled jobs are coming from Oklahoma and Texas, people who've been doing this for a while. But there's a lot of truck driving. There's a lot of 
you know, um, aggregate that needs to be delivered. So I mean, there are there are some local opportunities. This is not um, this is not going to change everything and make your community a vibrant, robust place. Uh, it's a nice stopgap for areas that are still feeling the lingering effects of, of the Great Recession. Um, but a lot of the real economic benefit right now comes from the fact that, uh, that the industry is able to absorb basically this excess labor who lost jobs and have not had a chance to, to find jobs again. Um, if and when we get back to a period of more full employment, some of the benefits of this will actually decrease on the local level because then be, you'd be competing for those same, uh, to the same labor pool. So uh, bottom line, I see benefit, but not, you know, this is not, the, the, it's not solution to everything. This is not a great, huge benefit. Thank you. Um, Marvin Ott, Johns Hopkins uh, University. Um, two two quick, uh, tightly related questions. Uh, years back, sort of era of the Carter administration, as I recall it, you would occasionally hear references to deep, sh uh, deep gas, tight gas, yep. Gulf of Mexico, hard to get at, leads to a question, is there an offshore future for fracking? For fracking. Is, is this something that could, could go in that direction? Yeah. And related to that, how, how big can this get? 2025, yeah. we reconvene, if everything sort of goes well, how big a piece of the U.S. energy pie is this? Well, I mean, it's already a, an enormous piece of, of, of oil and gas production. Um, I, I think it just continues to grow. I mean, the conventional resources are um, declining. So this is just not just taking over for those declines in conventional, but increasing the overall size of the pie. Um, yeah, absolutely. Offshore, it hasn't been done yet because you still have, you know, I just sort of talked about how you, 19, you, know, you had spindle top, you had the great big gushers onshore. Well, there's still some of those offshore, you know, and, and that's, it's so expensive that the only reason you're going to go offshore is if you have a really nice big oil field. But eventually, you're going to run out of those and, and the industry will be looking at, well, where do we have the infrastructure? Where do we have the platforms? And can we go into some of this tougher rock? Um, but, uh, you know, you, you mentioned um, the federal government, Carter administration, and, you know, since we're here, in Washington, I, I'd be remiss to point out that a lot of the R&D that went into this, that developed some of the early shale work, was, was, was Department of Energy um, out of Morgantown, West Virginia, actually. And so and it's fascinating to go back and read the papers that they put out because it was, it was a series of breadcrumbs. You, know, you read it and you can just take, you know, it goes right up there. It eventually needed to jump to the private sector because they didn't have enough money to do more than one or two wells a year and then they would run out of their budget. But, um, and you needed someone to drill more wells but they had horizontal drilling and they had shales and they were experimenting with fracking I and mean, they were trying to put it all together um, in the eastern shales is what they called it, so. I'll go right here. It's a very nice, <coughs> very nice segue into my talk because my name is Art Hartstein and I used to be on that program oh. <laughs> in the 70s, I'm old. And um, I, just, I just want to make a few comments because of that and it was an interesting time. I worked with Morgantown, although I was headquarters. Al Yost? Say again? Al, Al Yost? Yeah, yeah, he's a good friend of mine. He's still there. He's still there. He's not dead yet. <laughs> uh, he's in the book. He's in the book. Uh, you conf you're seem to be conflating gas production and oil production. You, you talk about the Bakken Shale, North Dakota, and that's oil production. Gas is really the name of the game now, although they've been doing fracking forever, as you pointed out, but only from the 70s because of the horizontal drilling does it make any sense to do fracking at 8,000 or 10,000 feet right. because of the economics of drilling a well 10,000 feet down. Here you can drill, drill a well and go two miles, three miles, like you yeah. said, out, and you can have eight wells, so you could imagine from one pad. Uh, as an aside, Hollywood, California has oil drilling in the center of Hollywood. They build an enclosure. You can't tell what it is. It looks like a very nice building, but it's got a pad with a lot of wells on it. Uh, uh, but to, to answer a question about conflation, the same technology, the horizontal drilling and the hydraulic fracturing, is driving the Marcellus, gas production Marcellus, as well as oil production in the Bakken and now in the Permian Basin. So 
I, I'm conflating in the sense that the same technology which were developed for gas are now also responsible well, for oil. Do you want to tie up your thought and then? All right, I, yeah. I, will, I will do it quickly. Okay. Uh, I just want, I'm just making a couple of comments. EPA is doing the underground injection control, but the states have primacy. Some states have primacy. They're allowed to do it themselves because they're better or equal to or better than EPA regulations, and they are working on it now. Uh, there's another thing, transportation versus electric power. Mm -hmm. Gas is electric power. Mm -hmm. Oil is transportation. Right. That's why you can have gas at $3 a million and a, and a barrel of oil, which is 6.5 million BTUs, could be over $100. Right. All right, I will... I will quit Can we call it there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you. Let's go right here. Do you do you do you still have a question? I do. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, they're can you identify yourself? Jay Bonsting, Old Columbia, Maryland. Uh, there there are many folks in this uh, country who really don't believe in the concept of energy independence for this country, or for that matter, for any country, when, um, when our fuel goes onto the world market, uh, how, does that, how does that result in energy independence for Americans? Well, you know, it depends how you define it. That's what I was trying to get at before. I mean, there's the one idea of energy independence, the very simple definition, which is that we're not importing or exporting. We are an island, and I don't think that's very realistic. Um, the way I like to, def to, to define it, and the way I think it makes most sense, is to say, look, we're independent if we are no longer dependent on any one nation. And we have, we're no longer forced to deploy um, our, our fleets to any particular place because we absolutely have to keep those sea lanes open. That type of options makes it a lot easier for us to, to choose, pick and choose our foreign policy. And that's a type of independence. And that's sort of what I'm arguing should be a goal, that type of independence. So as we export more, does it make us more independent? No. It, it connects us with, with the global market, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Okay. There's a gentleman right here. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, my name is Dave Price. I'm a DC resident who likes his energy and also is concerned with his environment, so here to learn. So thank you for a very journalistic presentation of facts. Uh, you spoke about your family, and I'd like yeah. to just return to that for a moment. So in their fracking experience, are they being terrorized by a Godzilla-like no. released under the, or are they more Jed Clampett from the Beverly Hillbillies, no. or what happened, seriously? <laughs> so, uh, somewhere you know, in between. Somewhere in between, um, okay. So just but, so your so okay, so good, good and bad news, right? Uh, they built the pad, two of the wells have been drilled, so far, good news. They can still go up to the land, they can enjoy themselves, all that's great. Uh, the bad news is that um, I, I suggested that they find out as much as they could about how the well was built so they could be proved. And my father worked the phones, this was with Chesapeake Energy, could not find a straight answer um, about what type of well integrity, how can you be sure, et cetera. That's a little disconcerting. Um, and then the other thing I'm bringing this up is that I uh, forget, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I got a panic call from my father saying, we just got a call from, the, from, from Chesapeake. Uh, they were drilling a gathering line, a small bore pipeline to connect wells underneath a, um, a small stream uh, on the property. Some barite was leaked, um, they used for the drilling. There was a small fish kill. What should we do? You know, they want to go on the property and permission. So fortunately, one of our neighbors is a county commissioner up there, and I just said, call the county commissioner, have him take care of it. Uh, but, you know, so there you have it. That, in some ways, that, that's, that encapsulates the experience. It's not all perfect. It's not all Jed Clampett. It's certainly not made, you know, on the royalty is very much money off this. Um, and if you follow Pennsylvania politics, you'll probably understand why. Uh, but, but it's not been uh, environmental devastation either. You can still go up and enjoy the land, and you forget that there's a well pad nearby. Terrific. The, uh, here, let's take this, this one. Hi, my name is Gina Angiola. I'm a retired physician, and I've been following this issue rather closely for the last period of time. Um, I'm concerned with uh, several different factors that I think were glossed over a little bit in this discussion, okay. one of which is this notion that wells can be made safe. 
Dr. Tony and Graffi at Cornell has excellent data showing that at the bare minimum you have 5% leaks right off the bat at, in these wells. And he's looked at the data out of Pennsylvania and there were 6 to 7% leakage rates in the last three years. And the rates that are happening in the newer wells are actually higher. So this is not something the industry necessarily wants. They'd like to correct this. This is right. a, an engineering problem. So given that reality and the reality that what we're putting down in those wells is not just water and mm -hmm. sand. Sand mm -hmm. carries its own health risks. It's also extremely toxic chemicals with known carcinogens, known endocrine disruptors, known neurotoxins. I think that it's going to take time to see what the real health right. effects are. Yeah. And my concern is... Is there a question? Yes, it is. Okay. M there is a question. What is the industry's role and government's role in putting the brakes on this so that we can actually do studies? Because mm -hmm. industry has actually blocked the medical profession's ability to do studies by forcing non-disclosure yes. agreements the non -disclosure and non-disclosure so agreements in Pennsylvania are... And atrocious. trade secrets. Yeah. So we don't even know what chemicals are going um, So just a couple real quick reactions. I'm familiar with Dr. Ingrafia's work. There have been a lot of other... Uh, studies that have disagreed with him, uh, non-industry supported, folks like Rob Jackson at Duke, and I would encourage you to take a look at that. He is considered an outlier um, and, um, in terms of his numbers. You know, I make the point in my book that we are 10 years into this, and we're just now asking some really critical questions, environmental health effects. Um, there are studies going on. Um, I think the MacArthur Foundation is funding a bunch of them. It would have been really nice to have done them five and seven years ago, so we'd have the information. At least they're going on right now. Uh, you suggest, I, I don't see any political will, frankly, to doing a full stop to do that full environmental health and environmental assessment. Um, I don't think that's realistic right now. I also have not seen uh, the evidence that would lead me personally to say, this is such a dangerous activity, we need to stop it until we have a better understanding. Um, the, you know, I would encourage you to look at some of the work being done by the Colorado Public School of Health. Um, and, you know, and I've talked to the folks out there, and I don't hear a, a sense of huge alarm that we need to stop everything. I, I hear from them a sense of, we're finding some things, we need to make some corrections, but it's, it's more of a, we need to make corrections, not we need to do a full stop. Okay, so, okay. let's um, group, so we, we have two, let's go ahead and, and ask both at the same time. We have a, a few minutes left. Hi, I'm Linda Gelfi. I'm a former USDA employee, and um, I'm from Wisconsin, just south of where they're um, <coughs> getting the silica sand from. And so I, when you said that the silica sand was blowing around on this place where yep. you, you were, and you could smell the chemicals, were those outside workers in hazmat suits or anything that would keep them from absorbing the chemicals or breathing the silica sand? Okay, hang Rip. on a second. Hang, okay. hang on, we're going to group. There's an, another person. Who, who had their hand? Yeah. Hi, Elizabeth Endy, um, local resident. Um, my question is, um, you said that they, it could be done safely. My question is, of the places out there now, what percentage are done safely? I mean, as you indicated in Pennsylvania, it's, it's above the average of natural leakage so uh, like what I mean wh where does other than maybe forcing Colorado to try to fix that are there you know is that the one lone place where there's any kind of okay. well let me give you a couple quick answers um, I look at Colorado right now uh, and to a little well Colorado as being really where uh, the state government the environmental community the activist community are having the most sort of frank forward discussion uh, and that's why I'm most interested in to see what comes out of it. Uh, so uh, I don't have a good answer. I'm not sure anyone has a really good answer of what percentage is safe because I'm not sure how even to define that. Um, you know, I, you need to do certain things. You know, you need to build the wells right. You need to deal with water. You need to deal with air. I mean, this is, it's not, it, it's doable and, and, and there are certainly steps being made in that direction. Um, as for the silica, no. Uh, they did not have masks, although I'm told that this was back in late 2012 when I visited, uh, that those were new rules coming to require uh, masks and ventilation. So they were aware that it was an issue, but the new state regulations hadn't come into effect yet, and they did not have protective gear, uh, clothing. So um, it's not a, 
it can be dangerous to work on, on. This is a difficult job. Well, you can smell the chemicals when you're in the chemical van, when you're close to them, that, and, and, and they were mixing them, and there was some. So you, it, you cannot smell the chemicals everywhere you walk around that two-acre pad, no. You can smell the diesel because of the diesel fumes, but that's Are about the it. Are guys mixing this? Excuse me? Are the guys mixing this? Sure, yeah. Protective? Uh, yes, they, they were wearing protective, like a hazmat type suit. Okay. This, this is actually on a different issue. The, the question of water usage, that also was not discussed in the race. They're mm -hmm. using four to five million gallons yep. of fresh water for well. Most of that does not come back out. And it has to be, it's taken out of the water cycle permanently. Sure. So do you think that's an issue given that we have droughts across the country? Uh, just real quickly, I think that there's, a, there's a simple answer for that. Um, there are many different potential uses for water, <laughs> agricultural, human consumption, industry. I think there, there are very important competing needs for this water. The one area where I, I am slightly troubled is that the oil and gas industry can outbid everyone else. It's not a fair fight. That is an issue right now. I'm not, you know, and I'm not, I don't have a real clean policy fix for that. Um, they're clearly different uses and we need to make sure that the, the water goes to different areas. Uh, but from what I've seen, at least in Texas, it's not a fair fight. All right, all right. Uh, fracking, this is something uh, that's going to be with us for uh, decades while, to come. Yes. The issues we're talking about, you know, probably do something like this again and again. Thanks so much, Russell, for coming to talk Thank to you. us about Thanks it. Thank you for having me. Thanks very much.